they're in the imaging department and uh, they're, they've got a patient who's come in and they suspect a type one dissection. And the next thing you know, they're, these guys are flipping up and down on this thing. And I'm looking at this, this and you know, <coughs> it pointed out to me, I get it, I can see it, but it's really hard. You gotta slow it way down. So I wanna learn more about how you can identify things on CT and uh, I think your next slide, I think your slide is uh, the first one is actually a video, right? It's a, it's a film yeah. that shows kind of the different slices. Yeah. So um, anytime you see a CT scan, the first view that you always see is the scalp film, which is basically kind of an AP picture. What's the, it called? A, a scalp film. The scalp, scout? Scalp film, yeah. So the, the, uh, the CT technologist will send the patient through the scanner without any contrast or anything like that just to get all the orientation right, make sure they have the fields of view uh, set up properly and the patient's positioned properly. So... This is just a short run through where they point out separate different structures. And so this is basically putting somebody flat on the table. They run through the CT scanner and it cuts you up like a slight, like a loaf of bread. So you're looking at axial views of the entire body, one image at a time. And based upon what you're looking at or looking for, the thickness of the slices can be different. So a standard CT may have two millimeter cuts, meaning that it takes a picture, the tray moves two millimeters, takes a picture, two millimeters, takes a picture, two wow. millimeters, or even down to half a millimeter or less with some of the higher resolution scanners. And so if you're doing a contrasted study, say a cardiac gated CT scan, or a CT scan, a CT angiogram of the aorta, you're gonna want thinner cuts because you don't want to miss any pathology because we're usually talking about dissections, aneurysms, ruptures, those sorts of things. Or with the cardiac gated CTs, you're looking for valvular abnormalities, aneurysms within the heart, coronary anatomy, uh, if you're looking at the, at, the, at the bypasses or even the native vessels. And so depending on what you're looking at, the protocols and how the scan's taken and the, the, the depth of the cuts can all be different. So you can see the various structures and then it just follows it down all the way down through the pelvis. You also have different types of views. You can adjust the contrast to show you different things. This would be the lung view where you're able to see the lung parenchyma a bit better. If you noticed on the previous run of the image, the lung fields were dark. That was the abdominal view or the visceral view where the organs are highlighted more than the lungs. And by simply changing the contrast or the depth of the contrast, you can see the lung parenchyma and the lung tissues. This would be important. This would be the window that you're looking at, say, ARDS, pulmonary embolus, pneumothorax, yeah, pleural I effusions. Have, I think you have a CT uh, of, of a slice of, a, uh, of an ARDS patient. And then obviously this would be non-contrasted because you could see that the that the, the blood vessels are not highlighted as much. It was more apparent on the last view than or the last series than this series. So now you're going into the, this is the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm that you're looking at. You can see the spleen off to the screen right, the liver on screen left. There's air and fluid within the stomach there, the okay, pancreas the that they're highlighting there. And then we have some static views where I can give you some uh, some better orientation, and we could talk about a little bit of the anatomy. Mm -hmm. But this this is this is valuable. <clears throat> the difference between this and, and chest X rays, obviously, the degree of resolution and the specific, specificity and sensitivity of it. Um, this gives you an entirely different amount of information. So this is a contrasted CT scan of the chest. And I say it's contrasted because the vasculature is bright. Mm -hmm. okay. The non-contrasted, the Hounsfield units, which is the degree of density that CT scans are measured with, would be much, much lower. So the vasculature, so just we orient everybody, axial ones, unless they're prone for whatever reason. Sometimes if they're going to have a CT guided biopsy, they may be laying on their stomach so the radiologist can access the posterior aspect, et cetera. 
everybody is laying on their back. And so posteriorly, you have the spine, you have the vertebra, transverse spinous processes, spine process here. Then you have the cord is mm -hmm. here. Then you have your ribs coming out. This is gonna be the scapula, okay? So this is outside the chest cavity. This is an anterior, obviously, pectoralis here, breast tissue. This is gonna be the sternum. And so we know that directly beneath the sternum, we have the anterior mediastinum. So if you have a patient that has a mediastinal mass, this is kind of where you're gonna see it, a thymoma, a thyroid malignancy, a teratoma, or even a lot of lymphomas will show up in this area as well. But this specifically is a, is a CT scan representative of an aortic dissection. In the heart, you have the aorta that comes out anteriorly. Then directly beside that would be the pulmonic valve and thus the pulmonary artery, which is here. These are highlighted in an angiogram or a contrasted study, meaning you inject the dye peripherally and then they wait for it to show up in the vasculature and then they take their pictures. And these machines are very fast. They could scan the whole chest in a matter of two or three seconds. It's wow. very quick. And so that's, and it moves so fast. And so used to, it was very, right, kind of fractured blocky process, if you will. But now the resolution is such that it's, it's seamless. It's seamless. You could scan a whole body in just a matter of seconds. And so the things that are important here when we talk about this is here is the, the, the carina is just right in this area. So this is the left main stem bronchus. This is the right main stem bronchus. And directly anterior to that, you have the pulmonary arteries. And so if you have a big pulmonary embolus, a big saddle embolus, that's going to show up right here. And it's going to be dark. It's an angiogram study. So the blood vessels are bright. The fluid, the blood is bright and any solid structure is gonna be much darker, so you would be able to see the embolus here. And this is the aorta. This is the ascending aorta, heading towards the root. This is gonna be the descending aorta. Oh, so if okay. you think about the aorta as a candy cane, this is the tip of the candy cane. It's coming out towards you off the screen, curving around the arch, and then back down along the vertebra into the abdomen, okay? Right lung, left lung. Next to the aorta on the patient's right side is going to be the superior vena cava, which is right here. So this is the area of the heart when you're dissecting and you're going to put in an LV vent and all that sort of stuff. This is the area that you're kind of dissecting around. What's and the so interesting pulmonary about this veins is, are going to be just, just beneath these. Yeah, what's so interesting about this to me is, is how close these, you know, we think about these, you know, we, we, we look in there. We don't spend as much time obviously in the chest as you do, but we certainly will look, but how close these structures are to each other. Yeah, it really is. You know? And you can see how, and this is, a, this, is, uh, this is a good illustration of the efficacy and the utility of a transesophageal probe, because this is the esophagus right here. Mm, well, that, yeah, that's the point. little small amount of air within yeah. the muscular esophagus. And so if you have an echo probe there, all this anatomy you could see. Mm -hmm. You can see all of this. Of course, you have to have the echo probe deep to the carina because the trachea is going to be in the way or above the carina. So the trachea is on the way because the uh, ultrasound won't go through the, the air. It'll be, you know, the, the, the ultrasound probe, it will not be able to read through the air and into another solid structure. The structures have to all be intimate all together. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's why you, that's why you don't, uh, you don't do a lot of ultrasound of the airways or right in that area where the carina and the, the bronchi go across. You don't have good images because it's not able to penetrate through that medium into the structures again. And so you can see where the, the echo, depending on how it's oriented, you rotate it towards the aorta. You can see that wire coming up for a yep. balloon pump, et cetera. You rotate it towards here. You can see sometimes your catheter and the PA, and you could also certainly see big art dilated PA with an embolus and things along those lines. So there's a lot of stuff you could do. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool. But everything is, it's a very, very crowded neighborhood. Now, can, can you go back? I to got that? a couple questions on that one. Is too. that a dissection? This is a dissection. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. So this is an aortic dissection. This is an aortic dissection involving 
not only the ascending aorta, but also the descending aorta. And I suspect that if we were to scroll through this whole film, it would involve the arch as well. So this would be a type one dissection, okay? Involving the ascending aorta all the way down. So uh, the, the wider area is the, that's the, the false lumen? Which, so the, which... wider, the wider area in general is going to be the true lumen. Okay, wow. Okay. So and the a, one that's got less contrast, it's a little more heterogeneous, mm -hmm. is usually the false lumen because it's mixing, okay? You have some stagnant blood in there and you also have the contrast yeah. mixing in there and so it's a little bit more heterogeneous. And so it's not uncommon for the false lumen to be bigger than the true lumen. And then in the, uh, what's probably the superior vena cava, up in the, just to the Here? left? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Okay, I get it now. That's all, that's all true lumen. This is all, yeah, so the dissection is not in here. This is the contrast bolus. So when they mm -hmm. give the contrast, it's always given IV. You know, okay. it's given through a peripheral line or a central line. It's injected into the, it's injected into the venous side, mm -hmm. and then it'll go through. It goes through the PA and then through the, back to the, the, the lungs and then to the heart and then out the aorta. And so that's where it becomes important when we talked about a gated CT being appropriately timed to the proper phase because you can get a CT scan venous phase if you're looking for venous pathology. You can get or at least an arterial phase, which is mm -hmm. what we primarily do when we're looking at the pulmonary artery and also aortic pathologies. Mm -hmm. You can get non-contrasted or you can get all of them so you can, can so you can uh, compare them. So, if you so have I, a pulmonary AVM, that would be a good reason to get a venous phase as well as an arterial phase because that AVM will fill on both sides. Okay, so 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 I understand and make sure I do understand it. Explain gated CT versus non-gated CT. Okay. What does this mean? Really so a gated CT means it's gated to the cycle of the heart. You can imagine wow. that the ascending aorta is a pretty mobile structure. Mm -hmm. It varies with the cycle of the Opens heart. And, closes and it's a dynamic and in terms of it has the, the muscular media. So it's not only does it move relative to its position within the body, it's a dynamic structure, meaning it expands and contracts. And if you have a CT scan that is not properly gated, you can get what's called a lot of motion artifact. And it makes it very hard to discern subtleties in the read. So if you're looking for just, if they have a dissection, you could pretty much tell it's a dissection on a non-gated CT. But if you're concerned about, say, aortic dilatation, a root aneurysm, dissection of the root, a root abscess from an endocarditis, something along those lines, something that's gonna be a little more difficult to see. If you just simply take a regular CT scan, there's gonna to be too much variation in the movement of the heart from beat to beat in, rel in relation to the slices of the like scan. Like a blurry picture. You won't get a clear cut picture as to what's going on. You can tell gross structures. You know, this is where the valve should be. Mm -hmm. this, may, this is the big PA, but you're not gonna see, this is the left coronary coming off, this is the right coronary coming off, <coughs> this is the aorta mitral curtain, this is the LVOT, if you're looking for somebody with IHSS, something like that. You're not gonna be able to see that on a non-gated CT. Now, this, this happened to us um, prior to TEE in the operating room routinely. Uh, we had a transfer of a patient from a hospital for a type one dissection. Um, and this is one of the things that they said later, but we, uh, we, we wanted to be well prepared. We cannulated fem fem. Uh, to uh, to go on bypass before opening up the uh, the sternum, open the chest up, the aorta was perfectly normal, but it was a non-gated CT and they diagnosed an aortic dissection that didn't actually exist. Yes. But TE would have avoided that from happening or no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you saw those images where we could see the aortic valve and the aortic root, almost all of the ascending aorta, mm -hmm. not all of it because the trachea gets in the way, the left and right main stem. You know, uh, the, the perfect example would be, um, you've got a patient that has calcified mitral valve. You know, you could see all the stuff on the, on the cath and the TE, and you open the chest and then, and lo and behold, after the TE has already been done, you have a calcified eggshell ascending aorta and you don't want to cannulate. You know, we've been there and so you have the epi aortic scanning. That is that narrow window that you can't really see with the TEE. And so that's, that is one area that it's hard to see. So if you have a aneurysm, or excuse me, a dissection in the ascending aorta, 
that is above or below where that TE probe can reach and that, that, that finite little area, then yeah, it could be missed. Transthoracic may be able to pick that up, okay? Or a properly gated CT scan. Mm -hmm. So that's very important that when somebody's looking at a CT scan of a, a CTA, <coughs> that you are looking for a dissection and you see what looks like a dissection, it is critically important to make sure that that CTA was gated properly. I think that, that yeah, that, that, that if it's a properly gated CT, then you can move forward with high levels of confidence that that's what the pathology is. Mm -hmm. If it's a non-gated one, you see a lot of motion artifact, or if the phase of the contrast administration is not such that it's mostly in the ar artery, you know, sometimes these things can be poorly timed. Mm -hmm. And so the, the disease, the, most of the contrast may be in the PA or the vena cava. You can see here a lot of contrast is still within the superior vena cava on this image. Hello, you're on the air? Yeah, hey, Joe, it's Kenny from uh, Pennsylvania, Kenny Lascalia. Hey, Kenny Lascalia, what's going on, man? Not much, not much. Um, listen, this is a question I had. There's a few times when they're trying to decide how bad the mitral regurge is to decide whether to replace it or not. And there seems to be discrepancy on the person that's looking at it uh, to decide, is it a replaceable valve or do we just leave it alone? So I was just wondering for the surgeon there, did he ever have any situations where it's a tight call and somebody probably would be called in from cardiology, but who would make the final decision on whether to replace the valve or not? Yeah, question. you know, I think that that is a great question. And I don't I think there's probably more than one way to answer that and still be <clears throat> and still be OK. So, you know, obviously, sometimes it's it's obvious, you know, if you have a severely tethered posterior leaflet that uh, an annual plastic is not really going to fix that. You know, you're going to decrease the annulus, but you're not going to be able to untether that leaflet. And so I think a, a repair, unless you're doing neocords and mobilization, et cetera, that's going to be a very durable, durable repair. And so you usually have that information going into it. Um, I often will call the cardiologist um, that did the study. They always know the day that I'm doing the repair. And so some of these guys go to multiple hospitals. And so I do like to make sure that they're around. And I have called them into the OR um, to take a look at that. And I usually defer to them uh, whether it should be replaced right away or if they say it's repairable. And then they'll oftentimes, right. because it's such a collaborative effort, they'll kick it back to me and say, do you think you can repair this? You know, there was, right. and, and it's, it certainly is a topic for, for debate, whether repair and replacement, which one is better. You know, some people are dogmatic that repair, repair, repair. Some people are indifferent. But I think depending on the age of the patient, the pathology that you have, the most right. durable thing is often the best thing. And I don't think that if you're, that if you're able to preserve the subcortal apparatus, et cetera, I don't think that a replacement is bad. I don't think that these people do poorly long term. If it's a young okay. patient, obviously you're going to lean towards more repair, and you may be more aggressive with trying to repair a valve that's marginally repairable. Uh, but I, I often engage the cardiologist, and I'm, if I'm vacillating and I'm on the fence. And I'll call the cardiologist. If he's not available, we'll have a discussion there on the phone. I mean, not a right. lot of times we can FaceTime these guys nowadays, you know, and the, so they can actually see the echo loops. It's not unusual to get uh, a patient referred to you for a mitral valve that has concomitant coronary disease and they've not had a TE. And the first TE right. they have is in the OR. And so you're actually kind of better delineating the, patho delineating the pathology intraoperatively and the cardiologist has never seen that. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they're fine with, uh, <laughs> fine with the surgeon making that decision on whether to repair or replace. Um, okay. You know, Ken, you brought up a good point. Let us see what you think about this, Dr. Duvall. Stay on the line, Ken. Um, yeah, sure. If you, uh, uh, I went to a meeting one time and uh, Carpentier was giving a talk. And uh, he's a very good speaker. Um, but uh, of course, he made a comment to one of the other participants who had given a presentation. He had done this wonderful presentation, shown this incredible mitral valve repair 
Um, and all of this, he replaced cords and he refashioned the leaflets. He did all this fancy stuff. And there was some leftover regurgitation, some, some residual regurgitation um, after the procedure. And Carpentier got up and said, well, I don't know how you could possibly think that's a good repair if you are leaving with mitral regurgitation. That's, that's not the way it should be. So, you know, I mean, that might have been a little harsh. I actually think he was a little harsh. But, you know, he doesn't point. Mm -hmm. You know, do you accept that or do you replace that? How do you make that decision? I err on the side of replacement. So uh, residual, I mean, is, is residual mitral regurgitation okay? I mean, I guess that's the, 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 the million dollar question. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what you were there for. I mean, if you have, uh, you know, say a Barlow's valve or something like that and, and you're left over with regurgitation, it's probably because you didn't do a sufficient resection or things along those lines. If you have a very stiff myxomatous valve that you tried to fix and they have some mild regurgitation or trivial regurgitation and they have concomitant coronary disease and you've revascularized that lateral wall or that posterior wall and you still have a little bit even though it's a lot better, I may tend to leave that alone. Um, and but it, it's it there is a lot of it, it's, it's it's extremely subjective. I think. Does it matter what the patient's lifestyle is? Absolutely. Somebody that's somebody that's seventy nine years old that watches TV and plays bingo once a week and and drinks coffee that in the morning with their guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know they don't have a high you know exactly. they don't have a high functioning level. They, they could probably tolerate a little bit more than say somebody like you or I that are up active all day and exerting ourselves that exercise and things along those lines. But uh, it's, it's, it becomes, you be, you be, you're being real generous yeah, with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ken, any other, any other uh, questions on this? Yeah, no, no, actually, thanks a lot. Uh, obviously the program you guys are putting on, uh, as I told you before, is amazing. Be helpful for uh, people out there to get their CEUs. Well, thanks, um, man. Also, I appreciate it. Also, yeah, I, I wanted to get the, the doc's uh, pr perspective on the question I had, and he definitely answered the question as honestly as he could. And it's something that, um, you know, you, you lean towards your experience and, yeah. and, and, and we basically learned that. Yeah. Are you doing a lot of mitrals up there where you're at? Uh, yeah, not a lot, not a lot, but, but we do, we, we do some minimally invasive mitrals and, um, oh, and, okay. uh, but I can't say that it's a whole bunch of, uh, cases. Not, not really. How are you doing your minimally invasives? Are you using port access or are you no. using some other technique? No port access, just uh, a standard uh, minimally invasive procedure with fem fem bypass, and uh, most of the time just you know, anti-grade cardioplegia, and uh, and you know how it goes from a perfusion point of view. They're, they're difficult cases as far as drainage and such. Yeah, does he use? Do they, does your does your guy use a uh, or gal, as the case may be, uh, like that long that chitwood clamp uh, and no. that long cardioplegia needle? Yeah, he uses a long cardioplegia needle, but uh, yeah, you know, you're right. He does use a chit with it and the and the long cardio needle. Correct. Do you have that? Do you have that clamp leak very much, or has it slipped off during the procedure very often? Not to, not to not as of yet. No, we haven't had any any issues with it. Oh, that's good. Okay, cool. How, how far? All are right. You? Uh -huh. Thanks, man. Thank you. Hey, all right, Joe. Talk to you soon. All right, Ken. Bye. All right, bye Thanks bye. for calling. You're welcome. Can always count on your friends if you can't count on anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So any other any other callers? Any other callers? I think we what, what, we were what were we talking about? We we're talking about uh, oh, we lost cardiac gated, gated CTs gated non gated. Oh, yes. that how yeah, you open right. up the chest and they had a normal aorta. Right. That's right. Okay, yeah, we did, yeah, we yeah, did yeah. that. Uh, Roger, you got any questions? Vicky, any questions? Magic, any questions? So I mean, I, I would suspect that, that patient on trans. I, I thought, well, yeah, I thought that, that that patient on transfer probably was pretty stable. And so, if there's a question in the imaging, get another image study. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that a little post-op renal failure from contrast-induced nephropathy is probably more benign than a sternotomy <laughs> and, can and cannulation initiation of bypass. 
uh, would be for no reason. But you can treat that with a little but bit you can of treat that. So CV but, hydration yeah. and CVBH if you really want to do on But, 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 but I mean, uh, you know, echoes and stuff are so readily available. It is not hard to stick one on the chest. And if, if you're ambitious enough, you could stick one on the chest yourself and mess around and probably figure out some of the anatomy and what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's uh, I've not had that experience. I've heard of that, but you know, ascending aortas are, that's, an, that's a surgical emergency still, you know, so you need to be sure. And if you're not sure, I think you err on the side of caution. If the, every study you said says that, then I would probably open up. I can't fault the person for opening mm -hmm. up and taking a look, uh, but uh, it's, yeah, that's never a good day. Never a good day. But, you know, before we close up, I look yeah, at a couple of these look other at ones. So, these. Yeah. so this is kind of a CT scan of what you would expect with a ARDS. And this is just kind of a diffuse pattern. You know, you, it, it looks as bad this way as it does on the plain x ray. And so you can see the cardiomegaly, obviously, and just everything is just fluffed out. There's no fluid collections or anything drainable that's not bad pneumonia that's loculated. There's no. Uh, PE or anything along those lines. This would be a di this would be a huge aortic aneurysm that is ruptured at some point. You can see that the ascending aorta here anteriorly looks fairly normal in caliber. This looks abnormal, and what you see that you should not see is all of this dark stuff around it. You actually see maybe a little bit of air in here. Huh. So this may have been a mycotic aneurysm or something along those lines, or they may have an associated pneumothorax or trauma. This is probably contrast that's leaking out this nice little enhanced ridge right here. So if you follow the CT scan up and down, you should be able to see that contrast as it leaves the aorta and, oh, enters, wow. and enters the, uh, the body cavity. This is a different view. So you have the axial views, you have the sagittal views, which kind of goes from side to side, left to right. And then you have the coronal views, which kind of cuts the body up from front to back. And this is just interesting in that it shows the true lumen and then the false lumen of this same dissection. What's neat about this picture is it has the pictures in the arch and you can see the intimal flap within the arch of the aorta of the dissection. So that would tell me that the sometimes the extent of where you need to open up the aorta, whether you're doing a simple ascending replacement or if you're going to do a hemi arch or if you're going to reimplant the head vessels, if you uh, need retrograde cerebral perfusion, those sorts of things, all those fun nuances come into play when you're dealing with a dissection mm -hmm. such as this where you may have to circ so arrest. Just a minute. I'm on the image on the left. Yes. Where we're pointing there. Uh, that is the actual that that's the beginning of the aneurysm. Is that right? I don't know if it's the beginning of the track. dissection, I'm but sorry, this yeah, is the, the this is the this is a dissection. Whether it's the beginning or not, I, I can't tell you uh, without looking at the whole scan. But it certainly goes into the ascending through yeah. the arch. This is demonstrating it in the arch of the aorta, and this is it extending into the descending thoracic aorta. Okay. And then this is just another labeled labeled slide here <laughs> of kind of how everything, how intimate everything is within it the is. mediastinum. There's a lot crammed into a small area, a lot crammed into a small area. But it really kind of comes together the way you were talking about the, it's, the esophagus is a great place to look at all that from. It's from, a great you know, conduit yeah. to image the mediastinum. It really is. It's cheap, no radiation, mm -hmm. and really benign. So this is interesting that this is a huge ascending aortic aneurysm, huge aneurysm. So this A, A structure is ascending, the D is the descending, and you can see how it occupies most of the anterior wow. mediastinum. It displaces everything out of its way. So these are bad. These are bad. How do you ever put a clamp on that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't. <laughs> you may just go circle right. rest and then deliver antigrade to the root after you open it. And this is just a review slide showing the types of aneurysms you have. I, I typically describe them as a type A and a type B. I think it's the easiest one that most people remember. Mm -hmm. You can get a DeBakey type one and type two. And the DeBakey type one, it based, the type one and type two begin in the ascending. So the type A is a, can be a type one or a type two. The type two is just the ascending alone. Mm -hmm. And the type one would involve thoracoabdominal. And then a type three would be distal to the left subclavian. 
This one I just threw in here as a curveball. Um, I don't know if anybody is online wants to type in or call in and, and see Let's if they can they it. can accurately describe what this aortic pathology is. If they guess it, they win the car. We're giving away two cars. Jennifer has already won one. Jennifer, your car is your keys are coming. Man, I want to answer this one. This is the first one I want to answer, but I'm gonna let someone else do it. Oh, you can win the car. I can win the car. If you know it, okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Well, you have to wait. I'll wait, yeah. There's a delay. So they don't know. They're still waiting to hear him say if somebody could call in and guess this and me saying it's a car. They're probably just now starting to hear it because right. there's that delay. So you, you can't jump it, you know, jump the gun, say it, and then you're going to call it out. You can't, just can't do that. It's you not want, fair. You want me to say it or not? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else wants to win the car? As a hint, these used to be repaired open. These used to be big cases. I, I, I oh, know. Then, um, they I'm, could be, and anymore. oftentimes this would be uh, managed with a left atrial femoral artery bypass, mm -hmm. LAFA bypass. That's right. And, or just the clamp and sew technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not answering this one then. You don't, you don't know it? No. Oh, I'm going to make you answer it no, now. No, I've not I've got the wrong answer. answer. I already now. know that. That hint made me know I, I have How the wrong know? answer. Because I just know that. So. Write it down. Oh, nope. and somebody's calling nope. in. So somebody wants to win the car. <laughs> I told you. you. Listen, there's motivation for people, okay? Hello, you're on the air. You want to win that car? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> who's who's this? This is Melissa calling a second time, so I should really get the car because I didn't get it for calling in the first the, time. Okay, the keys are, listen, I, I'll i get your address. The keys are on the way. Excellent. So, is it a co coarctation? That's exactly what oh, this is. Oh, very good. That's <laughs> very good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, and so, I mean, obviously you see, and it looks like there's discontinuity in the aorta on this image, but in fact that it's not. If you this and this is the sagittal view. You know, we talked about we saw the axial, we saw the coronal, this is the sagittal for you. So you're moving left to right, right to left in the patient. And so you have the anterior mediastinum is up here. This would be the sternum coming down. This would be the space where the thymic gland remnant is into the lung fields. This is the root of the aorta. And a couple of things that would tell me that this is long standing is you see how big and huge the innominate is yep. in the left subclavian, indicative of hypertension in this region. So those vessels have dilated over time. And then you'll, if you scroll back and forth, you'll see all the collaterals that would connect to the descending thoracic. And so this is exactly what it is. So do you know how old this patient is? This that, is a, that this, has caused this much damage? You know, that patient was, I believe, in their mid 20s. Mid 20s. Wow. Yes. Wow. So it doesn't take that long. I mean, and this you know. is a view of the same image, but taken in the axial view, and you can see the tortuosity in the aorta as it comes through, and then that defect. Okay, well, I'll be waiting for my keys. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> that, now, now that's the first part of it. You get the keys, but you have to find the car. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Melissa. Bye. Right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Were you going to guess coarctation? Uh, well, I saw the coarctation, but before I noticed that, I saw the you know the, the huge innominate artery and all that. And I was going to say that it was a dissection that went all the way up into the innominate artery and into the uh, mm -hmm. axillary and all that. But a bit of a zebra. But when you said you could do it, you know, like uh, just off pump or something, didn't you say that? I thought no. No, no, you could do LAFA bypass, <laughs> okay. you know, and then right. or you could just do some people would just do clamp and so where they would just put the clamp and okay. maybe occlude the uh, left subclavian, uh, you know, and then uh, you know occlude the left subclavian, <coughs> transect the aorta here, and just do an interposition graft and there. So the subclavian, but you have a higher graft. chance of developing paraplegia and stuff because you're 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 cutting off your spinal artery during that period of clamp and so right, all your radiculars are in there and yeah. all your spinal everything is in that descending <laughs> and everything's depending on those lumbar peripheral you know those lumbar and perforators and the intercostals and things along those lines mm -hmm. yeah we used to do a ton of those i mean this used to be very common of course it may still be as common a congenital anomaly but back in the early days when i was there as a perfusionist we i mean we pro i probably did I, Three of these a month, you know. In the, you were not at a beat the, center. You were in the old days, oh, University of Arizona, um, Tucson. 
we'd do three a month. This was a very common thing for mm-hmm. us to, to see. Aortic stenosis, I mean, mitral stenosis was also at the time mm-hmm. very, very common. We see a lot of MR now, but we used to see much from, from, yeah. from rheumatic disease, mm-hmm. you know, rheumatic, but that was all of those post-rheumatic patients. We used to see that. I mean, the types of cases that we do now, you know, with the exception of the coronaries, which has sort of stayed the same, um, but, but they're, vast, they're vastly different. The kinds of cases that we do have just, has just changed. Mm-hmm. Because it would now you do this with a with a with a stent. Yes, yeah, you balloon dilate this and stent this. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you do you, you know, I mean, given the diminutive size of the channel, the the natural channel, and then of course I know you have all of the collaterals going around, what's the risk of aortic rupture? with ballooning something like that is it is it is it strong enough i mean or or, or is there a risk and what if there is oh yeah there's always a risk and that's why you never do anything without having a wire across it to where you could put an occlusion balloon up and then you know t- temporarily right. stop the inflow either get in open up or get a stent across it and cover have a covered stent across it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay so there's 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 mechanisms there's safety procedures put there are yeah you know the incidence of rupture obviously situations. is very low or we'd be doing more of these open mm-hmm. you know but uh, mm-hmm. the, the incidence of rupture is low mm-hmm. okay got any more we have more yes we can do this all day this is an aortic aneurysm this is going to be infrarenal so this is well within the belly here so just some of the anatomy we're below the renal artery so these are your psoas muscles left and right this is your spine this is going to be your l spine this is, uh, this is just some of the viscera, the chitlins, as we say around here, rectus <laughs> muscles left and right. And then this is the, the, the aorta just above the bifurcation into the iliacs. And so this is the aneurysmal portion. Oftentimes it will be thrombos. It'll have clot in it or atheromatous uh-huh. grumus, gradu, as we used mm-hmm. earlier. Gradu. Um, and then in central, you'll have the, uh, the contrast. This is a classic example of what like an aspiration pneumonia would look like um, rather than an ARDS with these significant effusions that are developing. And, de- and this is a classic example of dependent atelectasis, a patient that's sick in the ICU. This is the trachea here, and this is the endotracheal tube within the trachea. So this is an intubated patient probably laying flat, been flat for a long time. And they get dependent atelectasis where these small airways will collapse yeah. and, they'll, and they'll fill with fluid, mucus, wow. et cetera. And uh, with ARDS, so I would imagine this patient is oxygenating poorly. Yeah. You can That's see, you can see there how the, uh, the roto, I mean, that is a the roto lot, bed would work. That is a like lot that. of fluid. Yeah. So yeah. this is obviously an extreme example, but I think it makes the point. And this is the coarctation from the coronal view. And this is a separate one where they've kind of developed a could possibly be a little diverticulum there um, within the aorta. And this is, a, this is for the last car. If somebody wants to, re- if anybody remembers these structures from we initially, when we initially started, if Ooh. nobody calls, then Patrick can do it. <laughs> well, those were the, now, now Jennifer, <laughs> Jennifer and, uh, and Ken, you guys are getting keys to uh, a, a fusion. Okay, so so those are you know those are not bad cars, but for whoever calls in, if you can name three of these structures one uh, one through ten, pick any three you want, you get one. That's where I, mean, I do have internet. We're back. Oh, we're back. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that technical difficulty, everybody. Um, You might have missed, uh, so 20 seconds later, you'll hear me say this, that we're giving away a Ferrari if you can name three of those structures. It could be any one from one to 10, but if you name three of those to see if you've learned anything, then Jennifer and Ken, they get the fusion. Whoever can call in and answer that will get the Ferrari, keys to the Ferrari. Now this is all documented too. So oh, it's right. documented. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to get keys to the Ferrari. I mean, I'm just no joke. <laughs> so we're waiting for a call, and I don't know if we lost people. Uh, we while probably while we did. were away. Oh, they're coming back. But I'll tell you they're what, coming though. Back though, they're coming three back. Three of twelve, I could do that. 
But I'm not going to. I'm going to let someone else get those keys. <laughs> no, 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 employees, families, and friends of HET are, are excluded from this contest. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put that across the bottom of the screen, Roger? <laughs> okay, I think that's been long enough. Okay, so I'm going to give a countdown, and if nobody gets it, Patrick is going to go. Okay, so we're going to go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five. Oh, look at this. We're getting more. Four, three, two. Or let's just move it up. It's just it, it was nine. Now it's sixteen. It's just coming back up. Huh? That's okay. What, what was that? Four. Four. So call in. Ask. Name these three. Get the keys to the Ferrari. Two. One. Lift off to Patrick. All right, I only have to answer three of 12, so I got it. Three of 12, yeah. You have to answer correctly, though. Oh, yeah, no, that's true. Okay. Yeah, I got it. So I would say that. Without uh, going over. Huh? No, yeah. Without going over. Yeah. So we have a, uh, okay, we have a right atrium is number two. We have a right ventricle. We have a left. Which is number what? Number nine. We have a uh, left ventricle. Uh, I'm going to exceed the expectations and tell everybody that these are pulmonary arteries coming off the heart. <coughs> well, we have a we have an uh, inferior vena cava. For anybody, uh, for any, well, let me just stop it for one second. I'm 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 not a hundred percent positive, but I'm about ninety percent positive. So I'm I'm really hopeful. Number two is not the right atrium. That's correct. It's not. Correct. It is not it the is right atrium. Correct. So, I'm bonk, <laughs> you have lost. Patrick is out. I still got the keys. You got the keys to the Ferrari? Can I see them? No. Yep. Okay, we've got the keys to the Ferrari. It Five seconds, four, three. Come on, phone's going to ring. <laughs> oh, Patrick gives away his Jeep because he got a wrong answer. <laughs> How about right. you? Why don't well, you try, Joe? Give well, a, with all of that said, no, that's okay. Yeah, I'm, give it a no, try. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't take the pressure. So I want to thank everybody. He can't we, take the pressure. We are. Let's go down the list. Let's go down the list. You want me to do it? Okay, one is going to be the SVC <laughs> going down into two, which is kind of the the where the ascending aorta comes across three is going to be the oh. knob of the aorta or the okay. the arch where the uh, left subclavian comes off that area we're looking at for the balloon pump four is going to be kind of where the uh, pulmonary veins are going to be back behind that azagus is back there that's the uh, also the ap window where the pa curves across to the left as well you may have a mass back there five is going to be your and five and six are going to be your pulmonary arteries Seven is going to be obviously your heart. That more specifically is around left atrium, left ventricle area. Eight is down into the sub lobar branches. Nine is going to be the, the right lateral heart border. Ten is the left lateral heart border. Eleven is going to be kind of the diaphragm and the IVC region. And then twelve, you're going to have your you're going to have your descending thoracic aorta behind there. Your your esophagus is going to be behind there, and then that's also going to be kind of right ventricle, left ventricle area. You win the, you know what, really good. I mean, this was a test and you have exceeded our, <laughs> our, our expectations. As a surgeon, I am really proud of you. That's a lot for a surgeon. It is a lot. 